Hi, everybody. Welcome to Past Summit 2020 virtual uh, edition. And I know this is strange times, but thank you for joining us. Uh, this is a live session, so it is not pre recorded. Uh, we're here to talk about understanding modern uh, data encryption offerings for SQL Server. I am John Morehouse. Uh, please understand that there is a delay from when I am speaking and when you actually get to hear me speak. It's about a minute, maybe a little bit, give or take a little bit. So if you have questions, please feel free to drop them into the chat. We do have moderators that are watching the chat. Uh, if I don't get to the question right away, just be patient a little bit and then I'll get to the questions as soon as I can. So let's go ahead and get started. Oh, one quick thing. If you are doing the scavenger hunt, I'll point out the QR code that you see on the, uh, the slide deck before you. So um, go ahead and take a quick picture of that while I'm talking and you can use that for the scavenger hunt that PASS has been organizing. Let's go ahead and start. So real quick, uh, make sure you take a take some moments to explore everything that PASS has to offer. Uh, make sure to visit the uh, sponsor booths for the event. Uh, even putting on a virtual conference like this uh, takes a lot of hard work and effort, and we can't do that without the sponsors that provide money, which provides resources so we can have these type of conferences. PASS has a very large uh, amount of free training and knowledge. Uh, make sure to check out local PASS user groups that you have in your area. I know SQL Saturdays, we're not holding them physically right now. Many, many areas are doing virtual events. So don't hesitate to jump on that bandwagon and start learning for free. Um, the PASS Marathon virtual groups, uh, I will say that I am probably where I am in my career. Uh, there's, uh, I owe the PASS organization because of that. Um, getting involved with my local community and whatnot. So please take a moment to uh, explore everything that PASS has to offer. As you go through your journey this week with PASS Summit, uh, speakers love feedback. So please make sure to take a moment to give speakers feedback, whether good or bad. I'm a big boy, so I can take negative feedback. The only thing I ask is that you uh, tell me what I've done wrong and or what I can do to make better. Um, the negative feedback, or you can, you can tell me that I completely suck today totally fine, that's not gonna bother me, but please make sure to uh, give me reasons why I was horrible. Um, and if I did a great job and you really enjoyed the session, please give me that feedback too. And make sure you give other speakers feedback as well. We thrive on that feedback to make sure that our content improves and so that the next time we can do um, even better for you. So as I said, my name is John Morehouse. I am a consultant with Denny Charing Associates. Uh, my email address is on the screen before you, john at dcac.com. You are welcome to email me questions about the presentation today, or you can even email me things if um, you have questions about SQL Server in general, you're stuck at work, you got a problem, uh, feel free to drop me an email and I'll do my best to help you. Um, I can't help you for hours and hours. Uh, at that point, it'll have to turn into a paid engagement, but um, because of the I'm involved with the SQL Server community, I am more than willing to at least try to help. Uh, and if I don't know the answer, I can at least try to point you in the right direction. I'm on LinkedIn at uh, John Morehouse, so feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I am on Twitter. Twitter is probably about the only social media platform that uh, I am on uh, regularly or continuously. Uh, that is, I always have to quantify this. This is that SQL R Us, not SQL Russ. So thank Toys R Us. I know Toys R Us are bankrupt, but everything toys, um, I touch just about every facet of SQL Server, except for hardcore business intelligence. Don't ask me to build a Power BI report or even an SSRS report and make it look pretty because that's not my forte whatsoever. If you want me to support the uh, infrastructure underneath SSRS, that I can do. Um, but so I, I touched a lot of things uh, of SQL Server. I do blog at SQLRS.com. Uh, normally I blog about the internals of SQL Server. I like to reverse engineer hexadecimal at 10.30 on a Saturday night because I don't have a social life. And I've been saying that for many years. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. Uh, I speak a lot, um, uh, both in, well, used to be in person places, but now it's all virtual stuff. Uh, I do try to blog and tweet as much as I can. I am a member of the uh, Microsoft Data Platform MVP program, and I'm extremely honored to be a part of that program. Um, I'm also a uh, VMV expert uh, for 2020. That's not listed on the slide, but I should have added that. I help run the local user group here in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, and I help organize SQL Saturdays. So I'm pretty active in the SQL community. So real quick about what we do. We're a consultant shop. You got SQL Server problems. We like to help fix it. There you go. 
Right now, you're actually viewing uh, the second level of the learning pathway pathways that PASS is uh, organized and put together. Um, the pathways are intended to build up on your knowledge, so you can kind of choose your own adventure. Uh, and right now, you're in my session, Understanding Modern day Data Encryption Offerings for SQL Server. Um, earlier today, uh, William Asif did a SQL Security Principles 101 session. And then later, uh, I believe tomorrow and Friday, you'll, you, can, you can go to Jeff or Ed's sessions to help continue through your adventures in um, understanding security with SQL Server. So later, later today, you can choose another adventure and go down those uh, sessions if you so desire. So what happens if a data breach occurs? And you'll notice that I said, if a data breach occurs, because really it's not a question of if, but it's a question of when. So in this infographic is um, a little bit outdated, um, but data breaches happen at a um, kind of an alarming rate. And unfortunately, as database and, uh, professionals, it's one of our jobs to make sure that our sensitive data is uh, safe and secure, not only from permissions, but in the event that the data breach does happen, we want to make sure that uh, the thief cannot actually get access to that sensitive data. More often than not, when I walk into organizations as a consultant, I see sensitive information that is not encrypted and not secured, which really does open up them from a liability standpoint because uh, things aren't safe, things aren't secured. And as a consumer, I wanna make sure that my information is protected as best as possible. So I want to make sure that my organizations that I support can do encryption from a SQL Server perspective so that they don't end up in that uh, space of being liable for things. So why don't we encrypt things? So that's a good question. Uh, my personal opinion is because sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's easier to just not encrypt things and hope for the best. Um, while a lot of us want to uh, do the things that are easy and not do the things that are hard, uh, that doesn't work long term for when we have to do encryption and make sure that our, our data is secure. What also happens is that we get legacy systems that have been around for a really long time that it would take a very large undertaking to go back and put proper encryption in place. Um, and the proper encryption could be a number of different things depending on organizational requirements, you might be regulated by the government, um, you might have other third party or outstanding constraints that you have to kind of work with, and that makes it hard. And so we don't want to go back and do the hard things to encrypt our data. Unfortunately, we, we really should be doing that hard thing and, and getting our data encrypted and making sure that it's secure. Well, so then if we have to do the hard thing, how do we do that with SQL Server? So there's a couple options with uh, doing encryption and making sure that the encryption is done correctly. One, you could let SQL Server do it. And that's probably why you're in this session right now. Um, there's a couple different options that we can use with SQL Server, whether it's native stuff, we can use TDE, we can use uh, always encrypted. If you are on newer versions of SQL Server, you can use encryption uh, incorporated with uh, a cloud solution like Azure Key Vault. You can use SQL Server with uh, another extensible key manager or management system. Uh, so there's a couple different options with SQL Server that we can do it with. We can also let the application do it. Now this, by letting SQL Server manage the encryption, uh, depending on what encryption methodology you want to use, the, the DBA might have the ability to see that sensitive data. And so there is a risk there if you don't want the uh, database administrator to see that information. If you let the application do it, then one, you gotta have developers who can program and code for that encryption within the application. The, the good part is that somebody who might have access to the database, whether it's a DBA or an elevated uh, user account login, the, if the application is doing the encryption, then they can't see the clear text value of that sensitive data. Only doing it through the application and the correct coding constructs would they be able to see it. So you do remove the ability for DBAs to see the encrypted values if we allow the application to do it. Now we could further control, control the application by using uh, integrated security through Active Directory, you know, things like that. Um, 
but it does take another level of effort to have the developers program it correctly to ensure that the encryption is done right. Or we could try to do obf obfuscation or masking. Now, this really isn't encrypted, and I do not recommend this as an encryption, encryption solution. Obfuscation and masking will only just basically hide the information. And uh, to be fully encrypted, we want it to be encrypted with a proper encryption key, uh, maybe a salt in there that would make the uh, breaking of that key even harder. Uh, obfuscation and masking is not, in my opinion, any way, shape, or form as encryption. And I would not recommend doing that in a production environment, um, uh, thinking that you are safe and secure by obfuscation and, and just masking. Or we can do this, which is ignore it completely. I don't recommend that either, especially if you know that you have sensitive data in systems and databases right now. Uh, don't ignore it, think, thinking that it's going to go away. Uh, more and more, we continue to see those data breaches happen, both on premises and in the cloud, uh, because we do ignore it completely. And we just, oh, we'll worry about it later. We'll worry about it next sprint. If you know that you have sensitive data that isn't encrypted, start the project now to at least go down that path of trying to get it encrypted as best as possible. We could do TDE, which is uh, pretty seamless to any applications that, and we'll talk about TDE here in a little bit, but there are some solutions that you could put in place with SQL Server that would require minimal coding changes um, so we can kind of go down that path. Again, you might have to be on certain versions of SQL Server, certain additions, additions but there are some, some things that we can do to ensure that we get things encrypted. So don't ignore it completely. Um, that's the last thing that I would recommend that you do. Don't ignore it. So we've got some options. SQL Server can do it. The application can do it. We can obfuscate it and, and pretend that's really encryption, or we can ignore it completely. So let's talk about some terminology about encryption that we need to understand before we kind of dive into some of the options that SQL Server has. Um, so we have a, a construct of, uh, in terms of how that's actually going to work. So let's talk about some terminology. So the first thing up is the SMK, and that really stands for the services master key. When you install SQL Server the first time it is uh, started and spins up, it's going to generate a services master key. That services master key is going to be unique across all your instances. So, and it works with the Windows operating system to generate that uh, services master key. So it is going to be unique across all instances. And that services master key will be used later to help do encryption within the individual databases, uh, depending on what application or what methodology you deploy to do your encryption. Some most encryptions will have to have some type of database master key or DMK. So we, uh, when we do like column level encryption, uh, and I got a couple of demos that'll show this, um, you, we have to create a database master key. That database master key is encrypted using the services master key from the SQL Server instance. This comes in handy, especially when we input encryption in place. Uh, if we wanted to move databases around or if somebody wanted to get a hold of the database backup, if they don't have the database master key password or the services master key, they can't restore it. Well, let me take that back. They can restore the database. They can't uh, unencrypt un the data that is encrypted. So having the database master key and the services master key is a great way to further uh, enhance your encryption. Column master key or CMK, this is gonna be played with your always on, always encrypted, excuse me, not always on, always encrypted. Uh, the column master key will be generated within the table in the database. And then the column master key will be used to encrypt the column encryption key or the CEK. Those two components the column master key and the column encryption key will be used if you decide to deploy um, always encrypted. Uh, and we can actually see them within the database. And I'll show you that in the demo as to where you can see that as we go through. We'll actually stand up uh, always on, I'm always on, always encrypted along with uh, TDE and uh, column level encryption. So you can see how that works. Next up, we have EKM, which is extensible key management. So Storing the keys is pretty critical. And we can store the keys used for encryption in a couple different places. One, we can create keys within SQL Server. The services master key is a key that is stored within SQL Server. 
the database master key is stored within SQL Server. But we can use, we can actually say, hey, I want to store them outside of SQL Server and put them somewhere else. Uh, a good example would be we can actually integrate SQL Server with Azure Key Vault. Um, that solution is a great way to ensure that the keys to the kingdom are stored offsite out of SQL Server. Uh, we can put controls around the Azure Key Vault um, from an Azure perspective, and but SQL Server can still reference it. So it's kind of like keeping the keys out of, um, out of harm's way by keeping it somewhere else. The extensible key management, that is what key, uh, Azure Key Vault would be. It is a EKM that we can tie into SQL Server to store our keys in a secured manner. And then we can use those keys to do encryption in certain areas. It doesn't have to be Azure Key Vault. There are certainly third party uh, solutions to use uh, as an EKM. In my demos, we'll just use Azure Key Vault because uh, it was uh, easy and available for me. So that's what we're going to use in our demos. In the encryption process, we have to talk about two different things here, well, actually three. Um, first up is the uh, asymmetric key. When we use asymmetric key encryption, there's actually two keys. If you've ever done any type of encrypted emails, uh, you know that you have a private key and a public key, and then you have to have both those keys available to one encrypt and then subsequently decrypt your data effectively. Symmetric keys, the opposite of asymmetric. Symmetric keys, uh, we only have one key. So we have one key, it'd be like, um, I have one key to my house and I give my one key to um, a friend of mine and then they have the key and so then they can get into my house, my residence with that one key. We only uh, create one key and then we just share that key. And so I use that same key to encrypt. I use that same key to decrypt when I send that information to a third party or second party. We can also use certificates. And a certificate is basically just a digitally signed statement. I usually equate a certificate to using like an SSL certificate. Um, if you're an IT professional, you probably have experienced working with uh, SSL certificates. Uh, when browsing the internet or uh, even encryption like emails and stuff like that. Uh, an SSL certificate is the same kind of construct as what we use here in SQL Server. And we use that to further uh, as a method to help encrypt data that we want to protect. So those are the basic terminologies that we use when we talk about encryption. Um, here are some encryption types that we can uh, use. So we can use column level encryption within SQL Server. This is where, as I mentioned before, DBAs, if they have the right uh, permissions, uh, if they're SA, then there's not, not much that we can do to protect against that. Uh, DBAs can actually read the uh, unencrypted values uh, and, and break that, break is the wrong word, but utilize the decryption to see the values. We can use uh, dynamic data masking, which again is obfuscation, not encryption. That's at the column level. I don't recommend this as an encryption method. Uh, yeah, you can hide the, the true value of the data from the end user, um, but there are ways to break that and get around that. And so I, I don't like that as an encryption option, but I, I wanted to at least throw it out there as I've seen it used as a encryption method. Um, it's not really. Or we can use transparent data encryption. Transparent data encryption will encrypt the database at rest. So what that basically means is that as data is written to the files on the uh, disk subsystem, that data will be encrypted. What that does mean, though, is that as data is extracted from the disk into the buffer pools of SQL Server and transmitted elsewhere, it will be unencrypted. TDE is probably one of the bare minimum types of encryptions that I will implement. If I have a, a good example would be a third party system. Uh, most third-party vendors systems, you can't alter their database um, without breaking some sort of support contract, but they might let you do some type of TDE and put TDE in place on their database without breaking anything. Now, complete discl disclaimer, don't go to your third-party systems and just suddenly add transparent data encryption and say, hey, John said to do this. Um, always, always check with your vendor to make sure that any modifications isn't going to void and break any warranty uh, support contracts you might have with that vendor. But it is completely transparent. That's why it's called transparent data encryption to third-party applications, okay? The 
TDE also helps with uh, backups. We can actually uh, protect the backups of the database as well. So always encrypted. This one, we can specify at individual column levels and we encrypt everything. Uh, what's nice about always encrypted is that when it's implemented right, and I can show you in the demo, I can actually lock out my DBAs from using always encrypted to seeing the unencrypted value. So I've actually got a database set up using Azure Key Vault, and then we can see that when I encrypt the column, we'll actually go to another connection um, and see that I don't have access as a, and I'm SA, you know, so I'm system admin of my local SQL instance, we will actually see that I don't have access to the encrypted values that I want to protect. So even as a DBA, I can't get around that. And then we have row level security. That's really not encryption either. Um, what row level security is going to prevent is access to certain individuals from seeing the data based off some row criteria, you know, where ID equals, you know, every, every even ID number you can't see. Uh, that's not encryption at all. That's just hiding the row value. The data is still not encrypted on the back end. Um, and if I were ever, ever, ever able to break the security, then I would be able to see what that data is. So we talked about symmetric key and asymmetric key. And I just wanted to show real quick, this is kind of what the flow looks like. Uh, I apologize for the plain text wording on the right hand side that should not be there. Uh, but if we have on the left hand side, if we start with the plain text, um, and so we actually have a symmetric key. And remember that a symmetric key is just one key to do both. So we go ahead and encrypt the values, the, whether it's a file or uh, values in a column, um, and we encrypt it. And then we have a ciphertext that is returned as pure gibberish. And then we use that same key to decrypt the value. And the person on the other side can then read that plain text and see what the contents of those values are. With asymmetric, John, before you go on to asymmetric, we have a couple questions, if you don't mind. Okay, yeah, sure. Is there any performance hit when it comes to encryption? Yeah, so when we, uh, great question. Are there any performance hits when we do encryption? There would, there would be a performance hit when you want to implement encryption like on a large database or table from the get-go because it's gonna have to encrypt everything. There is going to be a minimal uh, encryption, or I'm sorry, CPU hit uh, when we, uh, especially doing encryption like column level or uh, always encrypted, that CPU hit should be relatively minimal. I can't guarantee that, but I've never seen encryption causing problems. Uh, that CPU hit being one or 2%, maybe three or four, um, nothing huge. I agree. I've never had that either. Um, Mickey has another question. Us DBAs can read the data. Is that because we're sysadmin and it would be different if somebody only had read only access? That is correct. So uh, the question is DBAs can read the um, read the data and that's because we're sysadmin. If somebody didn't have the information, then no, that is correct. And that depends on, from a DBA perspective, and when I say DBA, I always assume that I have sysadmin rights. So if I have sysadmin rights, if I implement always encrypted, I can do, do that in a way where I can't see the values no matter what I do. Uh, and I'll actually show you in that demo. If I implement column level encryption, which also I have a demo for, I can, as a DBA, I will have access to the keys uh, to the kingdom. So then I can decrypt the data just because I'm sysadmin and I have the appropriate rights. Now, I can also grant uh, the ability for a non sysadmin admin user or a store procedure or code to see the values unencrypted as well if I grant the right permissions to the right things. We have to, we have to grant control on a key and alter on a different key or something like that. I'd have to go back and look and see what the permissions are, but I can grant permissions to certain users to see the unencrypted values. Great, thank you. Cool, great questions. Keep the questions coming. I like questions. I, li I didn't say this earlier. I like questions. I like tangents. Uh, feel free to drop questions. Uh, Monica, my wonderful moderator, uh, will, will be happy to interrupt me and we'll ask questions and go. Uh, especially during the demos, if you need for me to repeat things in the demo, um, then we can certainly repeat it. So back to the asymmetric key. Uh, this is just a, a, a diagram as to how the keys work. 
so we start with a plain text and then we have one key. Remember the asymmetric key pair. Uh, so we basically have a private and a public key. In this case, we use the one asymmetric key to encrypt our plain text. And then that is now encrypted. So that value can't be read unless we have another asymmetric key to decrypt that value. And then the plain text can be read, whether that's in a column or an email or whatever you, whatever you, whatever you're encrypting. Then as long as I have both keys, um, let me rephrase that. If I'm encrypting one thing, as long as the recipient has the appropriate secondary key, then they will be able to decrypt that value and see it in plain text. Um, and so that's basically how symmetric and asymmetric keys work. Um, in SQL Server, we also have an encryption hierarchy. And so this is important um, from a top-down level. If we look at that diagram, uh, you'll notice that at the very top in the blue, it's a Windows operating system level um, API that protects the SMK. Now the SMK, if you remember from earlier, is the services master key. That services master key is where uh, within SQL Server, um, not the operating system, but within SQL Server, that's where all the encryption starts. Then below that, we can see in the yellow box that we've got a DMK or database master key that is encrypted and protected by the services master key when SQL Server was set up and initially uh, started. As we go down through that hierarchy, there's one thing that I want you to notice. And this is where if we were in person, I would probably give you a break and take a drink and say, hey, what, what do you see common between all those paths from the DMK down to our encrypted data value? It's very, the very bottom yellow block. There's, certain, there's one thing that's, that is common amongst all of those paths, except for the EKM. And that commonality is the password. You have to have some sort of password somewhere, whether it's um, you create the database master key or the certificate, there are passwords that are involved. And this is where I get on my soapbox a little bit. And please, please do not store passwords in Excel. You might be laughing right now. I hope you're laughing right now. Uh, unfortunately, we still see organizations that will put passwords to the keys and to their encryption uh, into everything else, an Excel file, and then password protect that Excel file. I'm pretty sure I can probably hack an Excel file pretty darn quick. Um, there's ways to do it. Um, don't store, it, store passwords in a Excel file. Get a password manager, one that is secured. KeyPass is free. I, use, I personally use one password to manage all my passwords. Key, uh, LastPass is uh, a great solution as well. They both offer enterprise level solutions. Get something that will help you store passwords for your keys in a secured manner. As I said, KeyPass is completely free. I used it for years as ways to, to manage those keys. You can even tie it into Active Directory to make sure that you can control who has access to that KeyPass database. Don't store it in Excel or don't store it on a sticky note and put it on underneath your keyboard. Make sure you store those passwords securely just as you would anything else, okay? And use strong passwords. Don't use password one, two, three, four, five, um, or one, two, three, four, five. Uh, make sure you use strong, good passwords. Find a password generator. Most of the enterprise solutions will have some sort of password generator today. Um, so make sure that you store the strong passwords somewhere else. All right. So the uh, password management, it would have got that. Uh, and the, this encryption is going to be is as good as the weakest link. So if you are choosing poor passwords, as I just mentioned, then that is going to be one of you, your worstest, worst, weakest links. So make sure you use good pa uh, passwords. Using symmetric keys is faster than asymmetric or cert certificates. So when you are looking at you in doing um, encryption, there's a, there's a pro and con by using symmetric versus asymmetric. Uh, one symmetric is faster, but the um, symmetric is one key. So if I have stolen the key, then that's the only key I need to, to do damage. With uh, asymmetric, then uh, technically I just need the one key to decrypt it, but um, I need the, the other key to re-encrypt or do anything else. So, but symmetric keys are going to be faster. So when you start to look at doing encryption, if you want is performance an issue for you, using symmetric key might be a, uh, a better edge for you. Doing encryption with natively within SQL Server, we've got some options. 
the top box is symmetric. The John, is I'm sorry to interrupt you again. We've got some questions no, for you. No, here. that's fine. I like questions. Okay. Feel free. <laughs> for always encrypted, what if I need to make a schema change? Can I still use it? If you need to make a schema change, depends on what the schema change is, I believe. If you are changing just the table, I think that'll work just fine. If you are changing the column um, that is encrypted, I'm not sure how that would that will behave. Okay. Um, I've not tried that. The next question, if you're using TDE, all data is encrypted to the sysadmin, is that correct? If I'm using TDE, that's, say that one more time. If you are using TDE, all data is encrypted to the sysadmin? I'm not sure if we're using, I'm not sure what the, I'm not sure I understand the question. If we are using TDE, all the data is going to be encrypted at rest on the disk. It's not going to be encrypted per se to a login. Which I think it'll already. be a permissions thing uh, for the sysadmin if they have a, the ability to get to the keys, they should be able to read the data, is that correct? Uh, well, so if it's TDE, we're going to, we're still going the data within as we you know go into the management studio and do a select star from table dot employees, uh, the data will still be unencrypted because what's happened is because TDE only encrypts data at rest on the disk. When SQL Server brings that data out of the disk and into the uh, buffer pool, which every, everything SQL Server works with is always going to be in memory, so when it comes up off the disk into memory. It's going to be decrypted and totally available. If that user has access to read that table, then they're going to be able to see that data unencrypted. I hope that answers the question. Yes, we have one more follow-up question. When you implement TDE on a database and have a 10 terabyte database, you have to encrypt one at a time, or can you do the encryption over a few different time periods? like pause and resume and then continue the encryption process? Uh, from a TDE perspective, I don't believe so. A TDE is going to be enabled at the database level. So it's either going to be on or off. So we stand up and I've got a, a demo with that. We stand up all the right parts and pieces. Then we just uh, alter a database and say encryption equal on. So it's either going to be on or off. Um, now, if you are using um, encryption like column level encryption, I'm not sure I would recommend that start and stop there. Because then you're gonna have, that That probably won't work at all. Perfect, thank you. Yep, cool. So back to the native methods. These methods are available in SQL Server. Um, and so you can start using this today. There are no addition uh, limitations that I'm aware of. So enterprise standard, um, you can put this in place. Um, the symmetric keys work really well. The asymmetric keys work really well. Uh, you can use other things like hash bytes to help uh, uh, deal with like indexing and searching with, especially with encrypted values. But so if we are going to implement these native encryption methods, then there's a really simple process flow to get that set up and configured. And it kind of looks like this. First and foremost, I'm assuming that if the database doesn't have a DMK or database master key, I am going to uh, generate that, that database master key in the database. I want to choose whatever level of logarithm I'm going to use for my encryption. I'm going to open the key. So I've got the key open and then I'm going to encrypt the data and then close the key. So every time I insert or play around with encrypted data, I have to open the key. And this is using the, um, the native level stuff. I have to open the key, encrypt the data, do something with it, uh, whether it's re-encrypt it or read it and then close the key back down. That allows me to open up and see that unencrypted data. So it's relatively simple. I got a demo. We'll show you how that actually works here in a little bit. So let's talk real quick. We, we've had a couple of questions about TDE. We kind of already mentioned this at, 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 uh, on a couple points, but TDE is going to encrypt again the data at rest. So as soon as you turn that on, it is a database level change. As I mentioned earlier, it's either going to be on or off. And as soon as data gets written to the disk, it's going to be encrypted on the disk. It does not encrypt data in flight. So again, as we pull data up off the disk and into memory, that data is going to be in clear text. We can read it. If they have access to the table, the view, the procedure, the code, whatever, as long as they got access to see that data, they can read that data in clear text. It does, however, back up and encrypt the um, backups for that database. 
So by turning on transparent data encryption, our backups are automatically encrypted. The other thing that this will do, and I didn't, um, I didn't list it here on this slide, is when we turn on uh, encryption, your temp DB database is going to be, become encrypted as well. And that kind of makes sense because if I have encryption in place, uh, if I do temporary tables or whatnot, we're going to want to make sure that those values are encrypted in TempDB as well. So transparent data encryption does not prevent data access. This is again, TD is probably one of my lower level, bare minimum level of encryption because it doesn't prevent encrypted data in flight and it does not prevent data access. I much rather prefer from a DBA perspective, sysadmin perspective, I'm gonna put on my security hat because security should be everybody's job. Um, I want a more controlled level of encryption and I'm going to go up a notch and probably do column level encryption or always encrypted to better secure my data even when it's in the memory. Um, and there's, uh, you know, so I want to do that. So transparent data encryption will be the, the lowest level of encryption that I probably will include. Do, installing transparent data encryption is pretty easy. We first create a master key uh, in master for the server. Then we create another certificate in master. And so then we actually create an encryption key using the certificate from master in the database that we want to enable transparent data encryption. And then we literally just do an alter database set encryption equal on of that database. And then it is, TDE is going to be enabled on that database. As data gets written to disk, it'll be encrypted uh, and be secured. So that's that's a high level look at TDE. Again, I do have a demonstration about putting TDE in place. Uh, I've actually done that and included how to use it with uh, Azure Key Vault. So we can actually tie SQL Server with a EKM, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in this case, Azure Key Vault. And so I can actually enable TDE using keys from the Azure Key Vault. And I'll show you how that kind of works. Always encrypted, this is newer. Um, you have to have SQL Server 2016 SP1 or higher to enable this. This was a great implementation of uh, another way to encrypt data, as well as to get the sysadmins or the DBAs from being able to see that information. SQL Server really doesn't have any knowledge of the keys. And so that helps us to further protect that information from the DBAs, the sysadmins. Um, and it helps combine the SQL Server and the application. It's also available in standard edition. So it makes a great solution if you're, again, at 2016 SP1 or higher, uh, using, if you're on standard, using always encrypted might be a great solution for you to ensure that your data is encrypted. It kind of works like this. So we, here we have a diagram. We can see that uh, on the left-hand side, we have the application. They are uh, going to select from the patient's table. We're looking for a specific social security number. Um, that query is going to be funneled through a native client driver. And that native client driver is going to have access to the column master key. And then it's going to read from the database uh, and pass in a, uh, it's actually gonna pass in a, um, uh, scrambled or uh, obfuscate or um, I can't even think of the word right now. Um, the the gibberish of our binary value of that encrypted value. And then with the column encryption key, the SQL Server is going to be able to search that table for that value and then return it back to the native client driver where it will do, undo the encryption. And then you can see the result set that that Jim Gray is matching with the value of the social security number they're looking for. So you can see here, why and how the DBAs would be completely removed from the process because you have to do it through the, the application. And if it's done through the application, we can better control how and who uh, get access to that encrypted value. Now, always encrypted does have some gotchas with it. Uh, distributed queries won't work, so you can't do it over linked servers. Um, no default checks or, or uh, default or check constraints. So if your tables have uh, default uh, or check constraints, that can become an issue. Um, no partition columns. You can't do columns referenced by a computed column. You can't use replication with it. Um, aggregations might have issues, columns with identity properties, and of course, no triggers. So while I think it's a great solution, these could be roadblocks for you. So you need to look to see what your application and what your databases have in place today and see if those are any roadblocks for you. 
Um, I still like always encrypted as a solution. It's a, it's, it's a powerful thing to use. So um, definitely take a look at it. So I mentioned e, uh, Azure Key Vault. And so we can configure SQL Server to work with this particular EKM. Um, it does take, there's documentation out there. Um, you can just Google with uh, Microsoft documents and, and find their solutions and, and documentation and instructions on how to set up your SQL Server to talk to Azure Key Vault to make it work. In this diagram, we can actually see that we have on the lower left or in the lower level in the green, that's the SQL Server instance. Uh, we have our master database, we have an encryption key and all that. You do have to install a SQL Server connector. You can download it from Microsoft. Uh, it's a small install. You install it with your SQL Server instance on that machine. Uh, and then that connector allows the actual SQL Server instance to talk to the Azure Key Vault. And then with the Key Vault, we can manage passwords. We can manage uh, encryption keys or certificates. And what's nice about the Azure Key Vault is We've actually, again, removed the keys from our SQL Server instance and put them somewhere else. So we're using that third-party EKM module to store our keys and the keys to the kingdom somewhere else off-site. That also allows me to manage permissions for that key vault in Azure and not on-premises um, or within SQL Server. So me as a DBA, um, I'm going to pick on my moderator, Monica. Maybe Monica is my sysadmin and she controls the Azure Key Vault arena. She can lock me out of that Key Vault and then I can't get to, even though I'm sysadmin, I'm the DBA, I can't get to that Key Vault to get to the keys. So I've effectively blocked the DBA from being able to decrypt, especially if my keys are stored in the Key Vault using that EKM. She has effectively blocked me from that that process. So I can't get to the keys. I can't see the encrypted data. So that's a great way to make sure that we can limit permissions if we have to, to certain individuals or certain applications. It also helps us have a central location for our keys. So if we have multiple SQL servers and we are all using the centralized uh, Azure Key Vault, we can actually have all the keys in one fell swoop. If we use the native stuff, then all the keys are located within SQL Server, if you had a, a very wide uh, ecosystem, you might have to go get all those uh, keys and store them somewhere, back them up, put them somewhere. Uh, that could be a very large undertaking depending on how, on how big your ecosystem is. So I do like Azure Key Vault. Um, I like almost anything Azure, but Azure Key Vault is a good solution for um, using in SQL Server. Another thing that came out recently um, is in secure enclaves. Now enclaves, uh, you have to have the right um, uh, party driver and the right hardware to use enclaves, but it actually is a protected region of memory. And so what happens is that with like always encrypted and other encryption methodologies, an enclave will be a region of memory that is protected by, based off the hardware key. And so we can actually further encrypt and make sure that data is secured by putting that encrypted values within the secure enclave. As I mentioned, it does require third-party drivers. So I don't, know, I, have, I don't have any experience with using secure enclaves per se. Um, I think we always encrypted the native level encryption. Um, but if you have requirements or constraints that you have to use those hardware keys, um, I can't remember the terminology for the SMP or there's a chip on the hardware um, that helps, pro that provides the secure enclave when we do the encryption. Uh, SQL Server can handle it. So, okay, it is demo time. I've got about 17 minutes. Do we have any questions? We have several, okay. <laughs> but we're working on them here in the chat. Uh, do you know how TDE is working with SafeNet Key Secure? That's pretty specific. I do not know that, I assume that's an EKM of some sort. I do not know um, what key, K or EKM that is. So I do not know. Do you, I mean, have you, ever, have you ever messed around with that EKM? I have not. I will follow up and see if I can get you an answer. Um, the next one, when enabling TDE on a database, if there are users and applications currently connected to the database at the time, does that database become unavailable when switching to TDE and enabling it? So uh, great question. Um, 
does the database become unavailable? The altered database, I believe, will have to probably have to take an exclusive lock, but that should be very minimal. I do not know if that is just metadata about the database. Um, I'm not sure that I would implement TDE like in the middle of a production day. And here's a good one. I know the answer to this, but I'll let you grab it. Okay. Uh, if you use Azure Key Vault, what happens if the company loses internet or has Azure issues during this time? That means your data is not accessible, correct? If, if I'm using Azure Key Vault, uh, actually, no. I believe that the SQL Server will actually store the keys temporarily. Is that correct? I believe I, it caches it for a while. I think that it caches it for a while. So if you, even if you lose um, internet connectivity, you, you will still be able to decrypt and, and do all the encryption within SQL Server. That's my, that's my understanding. If, if I'm wrong, I will be happy to say that I am wrong. Okay, continue on and I'm marking that on my calendar. Okay, <laughs> all right, any other, so no other questions? I think we'll hold them until your next uh, batch of questions come in. Okay, all right. Well, so let's start, let's start easy. So here I've got, uh, and Monica, you can see my screen. Yes, you can see my management studio. Yes, I can. All right, cool, perfect. Um, so here I am, 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 I am in management studio and uh, don't mind the whole slew of demo databases that I have on the left. Uh, I, I tend to hork up my local instance of SQL Server all the time. Uh, I am running SQL Server 2019 on my laptop. Uh, I am running, I believe, CU8. So I'm up to date in terms of cumulative updates with SQL Server. Um, if you are running not 2019 uh, in lower editions, um, I highly recommend going to 2019. Small, you know, shameless plug for 2019 because it's been fantastic. I love it. But so let's, let's do some column level encryption. So this is using the native uh, encryption methodologies that we talked about on the slide. And so let's go ahead and encrypt some data just so you can see how this kind of works. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop my database just to make sure that it's uh, not there. I can start over. I'm gonna create my new database. We're going to just double check to make sure that I don't have any keys. Uh, given that it's a brand new database that I just created, we can see that there are no keys. There are no symmetric keys in the database. It's completely empty, which also means I do not have a database master key. And so I'm gonna create a new database master key uh, with the with a password, super secret password. Don't, uh, don't hack my bank accounts or anything with that password. Um, and we, can sh we should be able to see a new key appear. Ta-da, we now have a database master key and we actually have some metadata about that key, if that is something that interests you, you can actually go see what that key comprises of. Now that I have a database master key, I'm gonna go ahead and create a certificate. I'm going to actually use the certificate to uh, encrypt my symmetric key and then use the key to do my encryption. So I'm gonna create a uh, certificate. You'll, one thing to note is the subject, you can put whatever you want in the subject. You can specify an expiration date as you so desire. I tend to put my expiration dates pretty far out. Um, you might have regulations where you need to have, you know, they expire once a year or, or whatever, put whatever value you want in there for you. Um, I just tend to put them out because I've never had the need to um, refresh the certificate or change it. I've, I've not worked in an industry where I had to have that regulation. So I put the expiration date out um, quite a ways. I'm gonna go ahead and create the certificate. So the encrypt demo cert has been created. Uh, we can actually see that in this system view. So there's my encryption or my certificate. We can see that I've got an ID. Uh, it's encrypted by the master key, um, my, my name or my subject that I put in there. So I can see that it is there. And keep in mind that I'm in the context of my encryption demo database. So within that database, I'm going to create my symmetric key, um, the encrypted, encrypt, and I have a typo there, oh, wow. Well, Encrypt demo sim key. My naming, my naming convention is fantastic, isn't it? I'm going to specify my level of logarithm I'm going to use, AES-256. And then I'm actually going to use the certificate that I created in the previous step to encrypt the symmetric key. So now I have, if we go back up and look at the symmetric keys, I'm gonna have two. I'm gonna have the database master key and then I'm gonna have the encrypt demo sim key there. So I can actually see that in those DMVs. Now, this is where I'm going to stop you uh, right now. And this is what happens that I find quite often 
If you are doing encryption and you have created keys and it's not in a place like Azure Key Vault or some other EKM where that might be storing those keys, please make sure you back up your keys, back up your certificates, back up your master keys, your uh, whatever. Make sure they are all backed up, all the parts and pieces you need to be able to reconstruct your encryption process and more importantly, your decryption process in the event you have a failure or something goes offline, you have the ability to make sure that you can read and decrypt your encrypted values. While I applaud organizations that want to do encryption and they are doing encryption, encrypting data and not saving the keys and the keys to the kingdom somewhere else outside of SQL Server backed up and available is doing a disservice to uh, the IT professions and we have to make sure that we can do our backups and get to our unencrypted data, okay? So I'm actually going to delete the backups that I have now. It is hammer time if you don't back it up. So I'm gonna back up the certificate to my local hard drive. I'm gonna back up uh, the master key and the services master key to a local file and I'm gonna uh, encrypt those files with a password. You have to have that password to be able to restore them. So make sure you store those passwords in your password manager. I hope you're understanding that password management is very important in this process and that you have a, a third party solution to manage your passwords. Again, key pass, one password, last pass, just please not Excel. So I wanna go ahead and back up those files because I am a good DBA. Oh, that's right. And that died, that's funny. That did not die in my original, uh, uh, when I ran this demo earlier. Oh, okay, so now it works. So I must not have run it when I did delete. So now those are backed up under my, my local hard drive here. I'm gonna go ahead and open up the master key with that password. I wanna create a new table. And this table is gonna represent my sensitive data table, your employee table, your customer table, whatever. And in this table, I'm gonna have an ID, a first name, a last name, and my social security number. Now with the native level encryption, you'll notice that I have a, that social security number column, which is right here. That's a var binary. So for me to use the native level encryption in almost any level of encryption these days, uh, but with the native level stuff, I have to do this in a var binary data type. So the data type will actually be um, gibberish. It'll just be var binary. You won't be able to read it. Um, and you're limited to 8,000 uh, 8, 8, uh, characters with a var binary. So I'm going to call do a var binary 128, which is more than enough for my purposes. So I created that table. Now I'm also going to open up the symmetric key. And I'm going to decrypt it with the certificate that I created before. This is where I can actually assign permissions to non-sys admins and or like stored procedures. Um, you can grant you know, an application, a service account, whatever, access to the uh, symmetric key and the certificate in order to be able to decrypt it. They won't be sys admin, but we can grant them permissions to those two pieces of the puzzle. And then they would be able to actually decrypt the data as long as they had permissions to those two values. So I'm going to open the key. I, here I'm going to use the encrypt by key function. And so I'm actually going to insert a record, specify John and Morehouse as my two name components. My social security number is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And that is not my real social security number. So I am safe. I inserted one row. We can see that below in our output. I'm gonna go ahead and close the symmetric key. I'm gonna go, go ahead and double check. And we see in our result set that my first name and last name are totally clear text. We can read that, but my social security number is completely encrypted. Uh, nobody can see that as long as they don't have access to the keys of the kingdom and they can unencrypt that value. So um, if, again, I'm gonna pick on my, my moderator, Monica, um, if she was a plain Jane user and she had access to read the table, but not access to the encryption components, when she came in and did the select star from dbo.people, then she, this is what she would see. She wouldn't be able to unencrypt that value. So what do I do if I want to see that value? If I want to decrypt that value, I'm going to go ahead and open up my symmetric key again. And then I'm actually going to use a decrypt by key 
specify the column that I am reading, and then I have to convert it um, to a varchar. And I say varchar. Uh, in this select statement, I'm actually also converting it to an in varchar from my table. Now you'll notice here in the result set, a couple things. So one, this is the encrypted value. So we see that social security number has been encrypted. Uh, we see that the second column is our appropriate in our decrypted or uh, unencrypted value that we expect. We expected that social security number to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that value is correct. You will notice, however, that the third column is actually pure gibberish. Um, let me rephrase that. It's not gibberish. It's gibberish for me because I don't read that language. Um, that code page is actually because I converted it to a uh, invar car. So how you put data into the encryption in terms of if I am encrypting a var car and I try to pull it back out and convert it to an invar car, the code pages are different. And so you're going to end up with this type of result set. So if you start to mess around with this type of encryption, you start seeing these, you know, you're not expecting this type of language set come back. That's because you have encrypted a var car and bring it out an invar car or vice versa. So you can, that's a quick segue that if you run into that, that's what the problem is. John, yeah, could you oh, please, yes, can you please explain just a little bit more about the use of the var binary, var binary type? So the, the var binary is required from the um, native level encryption functions. So if you go and Google um, encrypt by key, the input or the output is going to be a var binary. So you have to store it as a var binary. Great, and I have a lot of people asking uh, for your demo scripts. Will you provide yes. a link for that? Yes, uh, and I apologize for that. I actually didn't think about the demo scripts. I will, all the stuff I have here should be okay for me to upload. I might have to sanitize uh, maybe nothing because I want to delete the Azure Key Vault when I'm done. Um, but I will, the three demos I have, I will upload them. I think that I've got the ability to upload them to the Cadmium site. Uh, if not, I will, Drop me an email, drop me a, a DM on Twitter or LinkedIn or somewhere, and I'll be happy to get you the demo scripts for sure. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, cool. Thank you. Cool. Okay. So that's how the uh, using a symmetric key and certificate works from a, a native level stuff. Uh, this is pretty easy to implement. Um, you do have to kind of recode your, your tables. Your, you have to add a var binary column, right? And uh, if you've got sensitive data now, uh, it's... It, it, from a code perspective, it's not too difficult. From an architectural standpoint, you might have to do some refactoring in your applications and or your code. One thing I do like about this, if your code is using the stored procedures and not like entity frameworks or anything like that, uh, I can actually implement this behind the scenes. Uh, and by adjusting my stored procedure, um, I can actually implement this so that the application never even knows that I've encrypted the values. So moving on real quick, I've got about 15 minutes and I still got two demos left. You can use uh, encrypt by passphrase. Um, that is another option to use in terms of encryption. So here I'm going to create a table called password and in that password, I'm going to actually another var binary data type. I'm going to specify a password of password one, two, three, four, five. That's not my password. And I'm going to encrypt a string, hello, my name is John with that password. So if I now select from that table, we can see that it is indeed encrypted. And if I want to see that unencrypted value, decrypt by passphrase, again, I had to have that password and hopefully it's not an Excel file or on a sticky note underneath your keyboard. Uh, as long as I have that password, I can decrypt that information. So that was native level, uh, what I consider native level uh, encryption using the encrypted values. Uh, there are limits, as I mentioned, the, um, these functions do have a limit of a, the biggest uh, value you can put in there is a uh, character you know, in Varkar 8000. So if you're looking to encrypt big volumes of text, this won't work for you. So, okay, let's move over to doing TDE in conjunction with Azure uh, Key Vault. Uh, actually, I take that back. This is going to be just standard TDE. Um, so here I am going to have a, I have a data set database, Dunder Mifflin. For those of you that watched the TV show, The Office, this is actually where this came from. 
um, a friend of mine in the SQL Server community, Tim Mitchell. Uh, he gets full credit because he's the one that designed that data set. You can Google Tim Mitchell uh, Dunder Mifflin. He it's a uh, it's on GitHub. That's a great little data set to play around with. Um, I've been using it quite a bit in demos. So great little thing to go use if you want. So I want to clean some stuff up. Oh, and that's going to die. Fantastic. I'm not sure why that died. Do I have? Nope, oh, wrong place. Okay, so my demo is not going to work uh, right now, and that is fantastic. Am I already encrypted? No. All right, let's see if this will work. Oh, whoops, wrong context. Uh, no, that has to be a master. Why can't I do that? Anyway, um, I apologize for the demo gods not liking me right now. This was working when I... So I must have the wrong... Anyway, I've only got a few minutes. So real quick, we can just walk through it and we can show you. Um, essentially in master, you're gonna create a, a master key encrypted with a strong password. Um, I wonder if I can just do this. So that we're gonna create that master key um, in master. You're gonna create a certificate in master. We can actually look and see, there should be a certificate here. There is this TDE certificate. So it's already there, so maybe I can re-encrypt it. With anything else, just as I, as I stressed with the native level stuff, make sure you are backing up those encryptions, uh, those certificate, I'm sorry, the certificates and the keys. Back them up um, so that when you have to restore the database or get access to that encrypted values, you can. So this is just the backup statement that I would have for that certificate. Um, so using the Dunder Mifflin database, I'm going to drop the encryption key just to see if it's there, probably is. I'm going to create a new database encryption key. And you'll notice that I'm using the server certificate that I specified that I created already in master. So that certificate has to live in master. And then I can actually use that certificate uh, with other databases as well. I'm going to go ahead and create my database encryption key that completed successfully. And I'm just going to uh, alter the database and set the encryption as on. We can actually look, I'm going to steal So this query, there's a, a DMV, DM database encryption keys. This query will tell me what databases are encrypted. Now the uh, one, the encryption state of one is unencrypted. The state of three is encrypted. So we are going to actually uh, turn on encryption. So it's literally alter database, set encryption to on, and then our database would now be encrypted with TDE. So now we can see that the database is indeed encrypted um, and that's it, right? So that's a pretty simple, simplistic way to install and configure TDE. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, and again, that's a, it's either on or off. There is no in-between. So as soon as we turn it on, now my data is being encrypted when it is written to disk uh, at rest. So again, once it comes up off the disk and it's in SQL Server's memory, it's going to be in clear text. So that's a really easy temp DB, or I'm sorry, TDE demonstration. All right, so let's go look at real quick and hopefully this demo will work. Um, Azure Key Vault. I will tell you, uh, just for time, I'm not gonna show you, um, you do have to do some pre-requirements -requ uh, in Azure to get this to work. You'll notice that I actually had to uh, set up an application for my SQL Server encryption. Um, my name is down here with, um, uh, as a, a, an access policy to my key vault. And in my key vault, you'll notice that I've got some keys once it comes up. So I've got a couple different keys here that will now allow me to uh, do TDE with, um, and I've already installed my SQL Server connector. You'll remember that there's a connector that has to allow SQL Server to talk to uh, Azure Key Vault. And so now I can use these keys to enable TDE for my database. So let's go ahead you do have to turn on this EKM provider in your SP configurations. 
um, so that you can enable that credential and that EKM to work with Azure Key Vault. <clears throat> I've already enabled it on my local instance, but let's just go run it. That's cool. So I want to clean some stuff up so this all works. That's fine. Uh, one thing you'll notice with using the Key Vault, if we go under security, there's actually a crypt cryptographic providers option under the security in SSMS. So we actually have to create a provider to say that uh, our EKM is going to be Azure Key Vault. So in your SQL Server installations, you've got this DLL that we are going to specify as our provider. So I'm going to go ahead and create that. Now I'm actually going to create a credential based off of that using a secret that I got from my Azure Key Vault. I'm allowing you to see the secret because I'm gonna delete that key vault as soon as I'm done here. So if you can write that down fast enough or take a screenshot, you might be able to do something with that, that secret. So I'm going to go ahead and create that credential. That completed successfully. I'm going to alter my login and add that credential. And then I'm going to create a new key in master using that credential and that provider based off the, some of the existing keys I've already got in the Azure Key Vault. So again, I had to pre-set up my Azure Key Vault for this demonstration. So I've already got keys there. So I'm going to now drop my credential off of my login. Now I'm gonna create a new login using the asymmetric key that I just created. I'm going to add the credential I created to that login. And now I'm going to create a new database, TDE, test TDE. And then within that test, that database, I'm going to create a new encryption key and specify my logarithm. And I'm going to say, hey, use the asymmetric key that I created from the credential from the provider that's now talking through the connector to Azure Key Vault. So go grab me the key and encrypt my database encryption key. That completed successfully. So now I've got an encryption key in the database. We should be able to see some keys. Yep, there's that asymmetric key that I had created. We know that this encryption state of one is unencrypted. So my test TDE database has not been encrypted yet, but let's go ahead and turn that on. Ta-da. So now, not only am I using TDE, now my encryption keys are stored in Azure Key Vault. And if I want to limit that and secure that even further, just remove access to the Key Vault except for the SQL Server application. And the SQL Server can continue to talk to it, but me, I can't, I can't get to the keys because I don't have access to the Key Vault. Okay. Keep in mind, I still can read the data because the data is going to be in clear text in memory with TDE. So that is TDE with an AKM using Azure Key Vault. Not overly complex. There are documentations out there on docs.microsoft.com. So go check out the how to set up your Azure Key Vault and set up I'll set that all up. Again, you have to create a, a services account in your Azure Active Directory uh, for the application for the SQL Server application and get that all correct for it to work. But um, this I was able to get it to work in relatively short order, but it is possible. This is a great way to use uh, a third party EKM in conjunction with uh, uh, SQL Server. All right, so I've got about seven minutes. I, gotta, I had one more demo to do always encrypted through the GUI, but uh, in the name of time, I think that we will uh, just continue on so we can answer questions. And wrap up the slides. So uh, trade-offs with doing encryption. With good things, there's almost always some sort of bad things of you know, some nature. So doing encryption does get some level of CPU overhead. As I mentioned earlier, I think there was a question about it. That overhead should be relatively minimal. Don't hold me to that, depending on what you're doing. But I have yet to see encryption cause huge, massive things um, when implemented correctly uh, in terms of CPU. Uh, once you've encrypted the data, you're not going to get any additional value from having it compressed. Um, your SAN admins might say, hey, we're going to compress it. You, you're welcome to try. You're probably not going to get a lot of compression out of it. Um, using the var binary, you're going to increase the size of your data, your indexes. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, 
indexing and searching for encrypted values one way around that is because it's encrypted and if you're not using always encrypted but you're using the native methodology um, you could actually take a value and use hash bytes and then in index off of the hash bytes of the encrypted value so you can use that workaround so that you can do indexing uh, on your sensitive data if you needed to um, you might have to incur some, some schema changes and refactoring to get encryption in place. Uh, if you're doing something else and allowing the encryption to do, or I'm sorry, using the application to do the encryption, you might have to have development to, you know, the development capabilities to actually implement that, implement that within your applications. Um, again, I'll leave you one of my the last slides. Please, I've said this multiple times, make sure you are backing up your encryption keys and you know how to recover from restoring encrypted values um, in the case you have a disaster. Uh, I have walked into many organizations where they have encryption, but they have no idea where the keys are at and they don't know how to restore a database if it's all got TDE or you got encrypted values. We don't know how to get the values back. Please, please, please do not uh, walk away putting encryption in place without having backups of your keys. So summary, as we wrap up, Hopefully you can see from this session that you, there's a couple different options that you can use with SQL Server to help encrypt your data and keep it secure. It's our job as data professionals to ensure that the data safety um, is done and done as appropriately as possible. Make sure you weigh the pros and cons of each option. Uh, test it thoroughly. I can't stress that enough either. Test your encryption processes, test your applications. Don't blindly just put it into place and expect it. Hopefully you have a test environment that you can turn some of this stuff on and configure it and then uh, turn it on and see how your applications behave. Do your due diligence, test it appropriately before you actually just release it to the wild. And hey, look, it's like I planted that line. Test before we implement it into production. Do your part. If you're a data professional or, or you have any decision-making capabilities in your applications, your database design, uh, your data management, do your part as a data professional to ensure that the, the appropriate data is encrypted effectively to make sure that it's secure. Um, one of us or all of us have all probably been a part of a data breach at one point or another, and it's no fun. I, I try very hard as a data, data professional to ensure that my customer's data, my data is as best as is as protected as best as possible because I don't want my data out there unencrypted. So encryption. All right. Questions. That's the end. That's well, that's close to the end. All right. It looks like we just have about three minutes, John. If you want to take a quick glimpse over to the questions and grab um, grab one. I think you've answered most of them. Um, I just let's see. Does Azure Key Vault EKM manage their own rotation of keys? Can you answer ah, that one? Great, great, great question. Uh, does Azure Key Vault EKM manage the rotation of keys? So it won't like rotate the keys for you that I'm aware of, but you can manually go in there and rotate the keys. Okay, everything you demonstrated today, does anything need to be installed on the client side to encrypt and decrypt the data and use the functionality? Uh, if you, well, if you're going to use the application to perform the encryption, then yes. Uh, if you are going to use always encrypted, then you have to install that client driver for the application. Correct. By using Key Vault, we now have to open up our SQL Server access to the internet, correct? There's no magic here. I guess it would just limit it on the side of where, uh, I guess it could limit that to one site address. You can, you can secure your Azure Key Vault to be a private link. Uh, so within your uh, Azure networking, so you can secure that so it's only allowing the appropriate permissions or access from uh, your internal network. You, have to, you do have to configure that though, right? Correct. Um, does the encrypt by passphrase use a particular encryption key that needs to be backed up? Uh, no, it, you just need to back up the password. And please, please don't use my password as an example. Don't use password one, two, three, four, five. And I think I'm gonna wrap that up. You've got about one minute left, John. Uh, the only thing I would add is, uh, this was just one step of choose your own adventure. I've highlighted the, the two next uh, gentlemen's sessions uh, tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern room six. Jeff is going to talk about securing your data further in Azure. I think he will talk more about Azure Key Vault. 
Uh, and then on Friday, Ed will talk about building a security dashboard for SQL Server at 1.45 p.m. Eastern, uh, room six. Great, I think that wraps it up. Thank you for attending. Enjoy Summit. Hope you have a great time. <laughs>